I grew up on the Wirral. Um, I was born in West Kirby and my parents lived in Hoylake. Um, but then they moved down south and I moved to Liverpool because um, I was at school at Liverpool College as a boarder. So I was there from age 11 to 18. I mean, for a start, it's very, very different then to it, how it is now. Um, you know, the, the, the mood of the, you know, there was 40% unemployment, um, the shipyards had closed down, um, Ford uh, at Hillwood was really downsizing. Um, it was very, and there was no money. It was very, very depressed. I mean, it was bankrupt and it sort of, in a way, it was bankrupt many times over. And so that's a very different story to now where it's really been really invigorated. Um, and how was it? I mean, there was still, you know, the pier head and the library building and, uh, you know, the Wirral was still posh, as you can say, I <laughs> understand from my deep Scouse accent. <laughs> and um, Sefton Park was still Sefton Park and Mossley Hill, Mossley Hill. So Penny Lane, which our school boarded Penny Lane, was still there. And the sign got nicked every week. <laughs> as soon as the council replaced it, it got stolen. So, in a way, not much has changed. Coming from the Wirral, you're always in sort of rejection of Liverpool because you want to be nice middle class. You know, my, my mother was born in Birkdale, which is, Southport is the posh bit of Liverpool and Birkdale's the posh bit of Southport. And that's where my mother was born and my father came from North Wales and they, my father lived in a place called Caldy, um, which was, you know, the golf course and, you know, point to point and hunting and blah, 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 all, all of that. And they, they were definitely from the Wirral. I remember when the idea of Merseyside was being muted at that, that point, you know, my mother almost slashed her wrist and said, I can't be from Merseyside, how awful. And in fact, her, her and all her friends had a very specific way of speaking as well. It's a very, very it's sort of upper, not upper class, uh, sort of middle, upper middle class Northwest accent is a, you know, completely unlike anything else. Mm. And, and you, you know, you see it all the way through to Manchester as well. Mm. Um, I mean, such, it, it never goes into Scouse, but it's very carefully modulated, which is why I sound as I do. No, the way I sound as I do is because I've been living in London for so long. I mean, I was very proud of coming from Liverpool. Um, and you know the, all the sort of idiosyncrasies uh, of of the Liverpudlians and the Scousers. I, mean, I, I loved them. I, I, I really did. And all the people round about, because I mean, of course, that at that time it was Lancashire and Cheshire. This was before the creation of Merseyside. Mm -hmm. But this whole idea of Merseyside and all those people, whether they from as far afield as you know Southport, you know, all the way through Liverpool, all the way to Runcorn, you know, they were sort of the same people. Of course, you could have been a thousand miles away from Manchester because um, <laughs> you wouldn't have anything to do with them. I mean, we were privileged because I was at boarding school, you know, I was at fee paying school. My parents had enough money to send me to school. But just the other side of Penny Lane, you know, there were huge council estates and, you know, their pe people didn't have money and were on benefit and, had, you know, it was probably three generations who were unemployed. Mm -hmm. So I was very lucky in the way that even though I had a privileged background, went to a good school, I could sort of get out because I knew my future was not there. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Liverpool, but, but it does and it did and it still does feel like home. So I've just been talking very specifically about Liverpool. I mean, coming from the Northwest, um, my, you know, my parents had grown up during the war. They were lucky they survived, whereas so much of Liverpool and Manchester was abs and Birkenhead was absolutely flattened. I mean, thousands and thousands of people died. Um, my parents were sort of lucky survivors and they sort of believed in a way they were sort of a chosen people and it, it, my mother in particular it, it's funny even though one tends to think you're completely original you're in fact not you're the exact genetic product of your parents and if i look at my father's sketchbooks he was an engineer he's got these incredible drawings and certainly my feeling from line came from him and my feeling from color came from my mother and colour and pattern and texture and she used to take me to the Walker Art Gallery in 
in Liverpool and Speak Hall and Port Sunlight and to all the gardens of the Northwest like Nest Gardens and you know, Sefton Park itself and the Palm House. I mean, that sort of artistic, creative influence was really given to me by my parents in spite of the incredible economic downturn that Liverpool was experiencing at that time. Certainly when I was growing up, a lot of how Liverpool people wanted to look is they wanted to look nice. They didn't have money, so they wanted to look well dressed. And, you know, they, maybe their house was falling down, but you know, they, they wanted to look smart for church on Sundays. So I think there was a lot of that keeping up appearances in spite of everything which was going wrong. Um, then of course, actually I'd left by then and, uh, and in the sort of late 70s there were clubs like Eric's and there was a whole new wave of music which came out of Liverpool and that changed everything for everybody, certainly for young people. And it became a really sort of a young hub as opposed to holding on to those values which were sort of post-war values really. It suddenly it sort of broke free from, from those reins and um, started to create its own identity. And this whole idea of that chirpy Liverpool, you know, whether it was June and Sandra for the liver birds, but that's where there's a sort of distinct relationship between that and when you see pictures of girls at the Grand National and they're wearing sugar pink and with a, a fairly remarkable tan <laughs> in the pouring rain and the freezing cold with a cocktail. And hey, why not? Because they're having a fantastic time. I remember reading something about Margaret Thatcher had said to one of her ministers that there was nothing that could be done on Liverpool and just sort of forget about it. But this is a city of millions and millions of people and how do you forget about them? It's one of the most callous things I've ever heard. And it's so funny, even though I've been living in London now since 1976, which is 40 years ago, um, I always do talk about people from being down south and I'm from up north. <laughs> I'm quite proud of it. I'm quite proud of that distinction too. And in, in, a, in a funny way, I still think that people from down south, down south don't understand people from up north. And it is this huge cultural class in every which way divide. Mm. I wouldn't say that one's better or one's worse, it's just different. I think uh, people from up north sort of just get on with it and they don't fanny around. I know that the buck stops with me and uh, it's a privilege to do what I'm doing and it's, I'm very lucky that my life has turned out the way it has done and my career has been what it is. Mm. But uh, it's for lots of different reasons but a big portion of that is luck but I do believe you can create your own luck mm. and that resilience that you learn when you grow up in Liverpool can create that luck for you. And around the world, especially in the fashion business, if you go to New York and you go to the shows in New York, everybody's from somewhere. Like no, almost nobody is from New York and they all started, you know, because they, they had a dream and then went to New York, you know, with their knapsack on their back and they got there. And similarly about Paris, people, very, there's very few Parisians, you know, they all went there from somewhere else. And actually the from somewhere else can be China or Korea or Germany or England. And you know, like all those great raft of designers which come from all over. Um, in the same way, perceptions of London are very different in London to, from when you look at them from London, from Liverpool or Manchester. Mm. Um, I mean, I slightly thought in those days that the streets were paved with gold. They went, but in comparison with Liverpool, Manchester, Hull, Newcastle, all those places, um, they were paved with gold. My sister had moved down to London and she sort of created a new life for her. My parents had moved down to just outside London. And, you know, I thought my future was not there and it was bright lights, big city, get yourself down there because that's where it's all going on. I mean, I'd, it's, strangely enough, I'd always, Funny enough, we're coming out of Brexit, but I'd always felt of my, myself as European, not as from Liverpool, not as from London. And, you know, London was on almost on the way to Paris, was on the way to Berlin, was on the way to Milan. Um, so that was just the natural progression. But, you know, if you wanted to be at that time, if you wanted to be in the arts or music or whatever, London was the place. My great-great-grandfather 
um, imported Citro Citroen trucks from France, and those had pneumatic tires. Now, when they were transporting the sandstone for Liverpool Cathedral, um, they, at that time they were transported on the stone was transported on trucks which had solid tires, and because of the vibration and because sandstone is actually very brittle and fragile, it's not a strong stone. They used to lose a very big percentage. Um, but what my grandfather had was pneumatic tired uh, trucks and with that they could transport the stone and would lose much less because the stone didn't crack. So he got a contract and this was, I don't know, in 1905 and it carried on till the Second World War. So, you know, quite a good contract to have. And I always used to sit down and absolutely marvel at the interior because it is, as far as I know, the largest cathedral in Europe outside St. Peter's in Rome. And when I was at school, it was still being built. They only finished it in 1985 or six or something like that. Um, so, you know, there was sort of building things at one end, you know, one end of the nave was not finished. And the extraordinary thing was there was a bridge in the middle going across. Um, so that sort of Gothic flamboyance and just size and volume and power and everything was immensely influential to me. And conversely, um, the, it, um, Liverpool Cathedral's on Hope Street, and at the other end of Hope Street is what we affectionately know, the Metropolitan Cathedral, Christ the King, which was known then and now as Paddy's Wigwam. Um, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> but it's because the big proportion of the Catholic population in Liverpool is Irish. Um, and, um, it, it was a loved cathedral, but I remember going in there, and to me also, it looked like a spaceship, and it still does. It looked like something from this sort of 60s, like Fireball XL5, or Supercar, or Thunderbirds, or Space 1999. And I remember going inside and sitting down in a wooden pew, and it was in the round, and looking up at the... Um, the, the top of the cathedral, which is called uh, the Lantern, I think, and they had the most extraordinary stained glass. And on the sides of the cathedral, the stained glass in the most deep ultramarine blue, I have never seen ever again. I mean, it was such a, a sizzling memory for me. And then I noticed in the center of this very sort of space age interior, there was this incredible, huge, taller than me, um, and I was probably looking at this about age 14 or 15, candlestick, which was an extraordinary Baroque candlestick, which must have come from Portugal or Spain or something like that. It was curls upon curls upon curls with gold leaf and cherubs and the whole thing. And I realized that this cathedral, which was quite minimal, was actually wearing a brooch. This was, it was exactly the same thing as you, as, as you see in every sort of design sensibility, like you do a plain thing and you put an accent on it. So in a way, you put a plainer outfit and you put a hat on it, or you do a simple wooden interior and you put a fancy chair in it or a colorful cushion in it. It's the, the thing of balance. And it was quite a eureka moment for me. And at that time, I learned a very important element of design. But, you know, my mother took me to Speak Hall as well, and I marveled at the black and white and the fact that it's Tudor and one of the, the most extraordinary houses in Britain. Um, and other houses up in the Northwest also, which were mm. fantastic. And also, I remember her showing me and I can't remember if it was in the Walker Art Gallery or not. She showed me a Hogarth painting. And this was actually when I was younger. I must have been about seven or eight. And she said, Stephen, you have to understand how there's a, a line going through the painting, which is a sinuous sort of S-shaped curve. And I thought, S, like Stephen. So I remembered that. And she said, that's called the Hogarth line. It's the Hogarth line of balance. And also, that was a eureka moment. Even age seven, it's like, ah, oh, that's what makes something look good. Things when you're young do stay with you. Um, I mean, I didn't want to be a hat designer. I didn't know I wanted to be a fashion designer. But what it, it taught me how to look. I mean, I, I was good at art 
apparently, but art and painting and drawing and whatever was just the way I used to communicate and both my sisters were reasonably good and my parents too and I just thought the entire world was like that I mean other people come from musical families where you know people communicate with the piano for example or mathematical families where science is you know just part of the lingua franca for me it was art was communication and these were certain times in my life when I suddenly realized that uh, you know, art could be a bigger thing than me doing a drawing of, flower, of a flower on a piece of paper. Liverpool College was a very, very strict boarding school uh, in, a, in a, an extremely old-fashioned style. And, you know, we learned how to play rugby and, you know, run the empire. <laughs> and that's what we did. And we always joked that it was for a bunch of thickos who couldn't pass their O-levels, but their parents had enough money to send them to a private school to force them to get them to do it. But actually, sporting prowess was much more important than academic results to all of us. I fitted in because I knew I had to, but I'm, I'm a negotiator and a diplomat, which is why I can work in the fashion business making hats, because if I wasn't, I couldn't. Mm. Um, but yes, I absolutely created my own world. Um, where it all made sense. Mm. Um, certainly when, when, when I was at um, prep school and primary school, I, I sort of created worlds, worlds within my head which were more real than my surroundings. And when I went on to school in Liverpool, yes, there's uh, three friends, we were the three who did art together, mm. and we taught each other. There wasn't any real art education there. And Yes, that was our world, which was independent, and we went off to the, there was an art room, and uh, we, we went off there, and we listened to music, and smoked cigarettes, and did drawings and paintings, and I learned from each, we learned from each other. Mm. Um, and so, yes, there was a parallel life, which was not to do with school, it was to do with finding out and experimentation. And I, be, you know, Yes, I was interested in fashion, but I was interested in appearance, mm. not fashion. Fashion for me was like, mm, it's a bit silly or something, but you know, appearance and what people put on, so what they wanted to communicate. Because I knew, for example, that we bore boaters in the summer. Now, boaters to all the lads from the council estate on the other side of the road, you know, said upper class twit. But that's what we wanted to say. We probably didn't want to say twit, but you know, we wanted to say you know upper class or, or different or you know expensive or something. So I learned from a very very early age what clothing represented. In in England or or, or in, in Britain, we're very aware of the class system, but we work with it and live with it. Um, so you know, a punk can talk to a duke mm. in a non-judgmental way because they're quite interested in their different point of view. Mm. I mean, I hope. Um, it's very strange because, for example, if you go to France, there actually is genuine and quite unpleasant snobbism mm. and, and class distinction. Whereas here, it's sort of there, and so in a funny way, they're absolutely the ingredient of what a British person designs with. There's other buildings in Liverpool that always inspired me. Um, that is the church in the middle of Liverpool. When I was growing up, St. Luke's Church had not been cleaned and it was perfect matte black because it had been burned out during the war. And that was incredibly poignant and moving. And that understanding of death and of mourning and goth, it, it's all part of the same thing. And that was extraordinary sort of religious um, influence. I mean, I think the thing is with St. Luke's, it was the poignancy and the cleverness of, no, there wasn't a giant memorial built, but what was there, it was a church which had been bombed, and that was left as Liverpool's memorial to the Blitz and to the thousands of people that died. There could be nothing more perfect or more beautiful, and I'd love to know who thought of that idea, but that was actually the perfect monument. And similarly, the Philharmonic Hall, which was you know, fantastic Art Deco. And we had our speech day there, then my school had a speech day there. And going in there through the etched glass doors, um, 
was extraordinary because then you were in this fantastic ice cream cone of an interior. And on the sides, there were these 30s, um, 1930s Art Deco illustrations of women playing different instruments in profile. Um, and they were etched into the plaster work and then gold leafed. And I always thought they were so beautiful. Um, and certainly that has been something in the cocktail of what made me. There's certain things about traveling to Liverpool. There's two traveling things that I really remember. The first thing is, as a child, my father taking me back to school at the beginning of term time. You know, for most people, when they go back to school, it's like hideous first day. But for us, it was really hideous because we were saying goodbye to home, we were saying goodbye to parents. I didn't know until much later in life that my parents felt exactly the same way. But in the Mersey Tunnel, because we lived in the Wirral and we were going to Liverpool, there was a sign with, I think it had a stripe actually around the tunnel and it had Cheshire written on one side of the stripe and Lancashire on the other side of the stripe. And at that point, that was when I burst into tears. <laughs> because <laughs> I knew I was going back to the school. So that was one thing, but that was when I was quite young, or not burst into tears, but certainly I thought, oh my God, I can't bear this. I'm going to have to go back to school. The other thing is, in more recent time, is taking the, taking the train up to Liverpool. So, you know, you, you, you come in and you go through Crewe and then Warrington and, you know, go over the bridge and then you come in and you go past where my school is, and it still is there. And through the leaves, you can see the, the buildings and the playing fields. And it's sort of like seeing a long lost friend in a way. And then you go back, go through Edge Hill to the funny old buildings, which are still there all these years down the line. And then you arrive in Lime Street Station. And I get off the train, and every time I go there, I remember that is where I smoked my first cigarette, age about 14 or 15 or something. And I bought a packet of San Maritz cigarettes because that's what Brian Ferry smoked. When I go back, I know it. It might be 40 years ago, but I know it. It does feel like home. Of course, it's sort of changed and so when you go back and you think, well, that building's no longer there. But there's a certain sort of, there's a grandeur to Liverpool. I mean, this is also the extraordinary thing, that Liverpool, maybe it's women showing their extreme tans at Grant National, but the Victorian and Wardian equivalent of that is seen in St George's Hall or the Picton Library or these incredibly grandiose buildings which were constructed to show Liverpool's power. Of course, that those buildings were paid for by the trade because it was such a wealthy city at that point. And of course, sadly, earlier on, it was absolutely one of the points of the slave triangle too. So that's where a lot of the money earlier on in the Georgian buildings came from. But Liverpool is quite spectacular. It's funny enough, it's spectacular in the way that London isn't.